Welcome to Mind, Muscle, and Metabolism, the Jade Tita Podcast. Here you get the in-depth science and practical tools needed to change your body, optimize your health, and elevate your mindset. I'm Dr. Jade Tita, and here is what I want you to know. You are different. You are as unique on the inside chemically as you are on the outside physically. And those differences matter. They matter because there is only one rule to achieving optimal health, fitness, and body change. That rule, do what works for you. My goal is to help you understand exactly how. I'm so excited you're here. Your transformation starts right now. Okay, welcome to the podcast. Today's topic is everyone's favorite topic, whether you hate it or you love it, believe in it or don't believe in it. Adrenal fatigue is all of the talk, isn't it? Anytime someone has any issues with anything, it seems like it's adrenal fatigue. If you get a hangnail, it's adrenal fatigue. If you stub your toe, it's adrenal fatigue. Everyone thinks they have adrenal fatigue. So let's cover this topic in depth. What exactly is adrenal fatigue? Well, first of all, I'm going to say this very clearly. There is no such thing as adrenal fatigue in medicine. I'm going to say that again. There is really no such thing as adrenal fatigue in medicine. That is confusing for people in the alternative community in alternative medicine, complementary medicine, et cetera, because they speak and talk about adrenal fatigue as if it is a diagnosis, as if it is a known thing. And obviously, if you go out into the blogosphere, you'll see all kinds of people talking about adrenal fatigue as as if it is a thing that you have, an actual disease state. And it is not. It is not a diagnostic term. It is not recognized in medicine as a diagnostic term. It's not actually a real thing in medicine. So that's the first thing that you need to understand. Now, adrenal insufficiency is a diagnosis in medicine. And that is something that usually if you have adrenal insufficiency, uh, what is known as Addison's disease, you are in pretty big trouble. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, President Kennedy was dealing with Addison's disease. And Addison's disease is a situation where your adrenal glands are not really producing any cortisol or very little cortisol or some of the other hormones. And you're pretty much taking drugs constantly because the adrenals are very, very important. So then you might wonder, well, Jade, where does this term adrenal fatigue come from then? Well, It's a functional term. It's a term that we use in functional medicine uh, that explains a group of disturbances, metabolic signs and symptoms that are not yet a disease state or a recognized diagnosis. Now, this is tough because it is very difficult to make sense of something. The reason we want to diagnose things, which diagnosis is a you know, sort of thing that happens in medicine where we give a name to a disease condition. And once we name it, we're better able to study it oftentimes. And we can label it with all the intricate details about that particular disease. It means we know a lot about it. We've seen it show up a lot. We can define it pretty clearly. The reason why adrenal fatigue is not a diagnosis is because it does not really It's not really defined well. We don't really know what's going on here or if anything's going on. Fatigue is the most prevalent thing that shows up in medicine. If you're a primary care physician, which I was, that's what we see. We see fatigue all of the time, and we have a diagnostic criteria that we go through. One of the first things we rule out is anemia, especially in a menstruating woman, we rule out anemia. It's one of the most common causes of fatigue. So we rule out iron deficiency anemia. We rule out macrocytic anemia, which is a B vitamin anemia. That is the most important thing. Then we want to rule out things like thyroid issues. Thyroid is a pretty prevalent condition that causes fatigue. Of course, we want to rule out things like sleep disturbances, sleep apnea, snoring. This causes fatigue not getting enough sleep, fragmented sleep, these things cause fatigue. Blood sugar issues, 
having low blood sugar levels or very high blood sugar levels due to insulin resistance causes fatigue. There are so many things that can cause fatigue, viral and bacterial infections, chronic viral infections that sort of hang around for a while, like um, CMV, cytomegalovirus, and uh, Lyme's disease, and other bacterial infections, and those kinds of things can cause fatigue. And all of these are going to really need to be ruled out and looked at. Cancer and immune, other immune issues, autoimmune disease, all these things come along with fatigue. So we have to understand what we're talking about here. It is really actually kind of silly for us to go, oh, I'm feeling tired, therefore I have adrenal fatigue. So that is the, that's the first thing you need to know, that it's one of these terms that when you see someone using it, you should kind of raise your eyebrows a little bit and just be like, oh, okay, adrenal fatigue. Adrenal fatigue is a lot like saying I'm overwhelmed and confused because it really is one of these catch-all phrases that really doesn't mean much at all other than, you know what, I'm feeling fatigued and I, deal, I don't really know why. And I'm just going to label it adrenal fatigue. Now, obviously, there are some things that can happen. What if you have none of these things. You're not dealing with anemia. You're not dealing with uh, fatigue of chronic disease. You don't have an autoimmune condition. You are uh, not having blood sugar irregularities. All of those types of things, yet you are having fatigue and you are seeing certain things that are troublesome for you, like you have poor exercise performance, poor exercise recovery. You're noticing that your libido is falling. You're noticing that your menstruation is irregular. If you're a man, you're noticing your erections are less firm. You're noticing your mood has changed. Hunger, energy, and cravings, heck, is out of check. Schmeck is also out of check. Mood and sleep, all these things, but you can't really determine what's wrong. Maybe you've had and had the workups, and you've ruled out thyroid issues, and you've ruled out anemia, and you've ruled out uh, infections, and you're still fatigued. And you believe that this has come from maybe chronic dieting or chronic overtraining. That's the only thing that you can pinpoint it to. Do you have adrenal fatigue then? Well, if you want to call it adrenal fatigue, you certainly can. I have started to refer to it as a number of things. Adrenal fatigue is certainly one we could use, but as long as you understand it's really not a diagnostic term and it's really not telling you much about what's going on, and I'll explain that in just a minute. So you can certainly use that term if you want. Some people are now using a term like metabolic damage or metabolic resistance or metabolic compensation. Actually, This is one of the things that I've started to do because if you listen to my work, you'll see that I break down the metabolism into these different five laws. Law number one being metabolic compensation. And I believe I covered the five laws in episode number three of this podcast. And one of the things you have to understand is that the metabolism is a stress barometer, right? That's what it is. And so it's registering stress all the time that it has to respond to that stress. Now, we all know that even with the metabolism, which is very resilient and very adaptive and very reactive, sometimes we can be in stressful situations that overwhelm the capacity of our bodies to compensate, to adapt, to react, to react, to recover, to repair, to adapt to stress. And then we'll start to see all the signs and symptoms associated with an overly stressed system. And so first we see metabolic compensation, hunger, energy, and cravings. Heck will go out of check. Schmeck will go out of check. Metabolic rate may decline. Thyroid uh, levels may uh, decrease. You may start to see some issues around that. But normally this is just, hey, I'm feeling a little bit fatigued. Maybe I need some extra sleep. I need to eat a little bit better. I need to train a little bit less. I need to spend a little bit more time in rest and recovery. And oftentimes you can turn that around pretty quickly with the metabolic compensation. Now, if the stress continues, I call that metabolic resistance. When you start getting to a place where it just seems like no matter what you do, your hunger stays elevated, your cravings stay elevated, and your energy is starting to become unpredictable and unstable. Sometimes you feel okay, sometimes you don't. Weight 
loss is starting to become impossible. You're not liking the way you look. Maybe you're starting to look a little bit more puffy. And so metabolic resistance for me is just another non-diagnostic way of describing this stress barometer going a little bit deeper. And then, of course, the final thing is metabolic damage, where now the stress has become so great, maybe now you're actually dealing with real metabolic disease conditions. Maybe you are starting to get irritable bowel syndrome, and we can diagnose that. Maybe you are now suffering from hypothyroid, and we can diagnose that. Maybe now we are in a position where we can say, oh, you know, you have amenorrhea because you've lost your menses, all these descriptive terms that then we can go back and say, well, here's the diagnoses. What do we know usually causes this? We can't really do that with adrenal fatigue. So let's get into this a little deeper. What exactly is adrenal fatigue? People have this idea that your adrenals are sort of like a horse, like a racehorse. And as the, if they are functioning appropriately, that horse is off and running and can run hard and recover fast and do all the things it needs to do. But if you keep pushing that horse, keep pushing that horse, keep pushing that horse, it's going to begin to slow down. And then eventually, you're just going to have this tired heap of rubble on the ground of a horse that is completely exhausted. And we, we have this idea that the adrenal glands just give out that way. And that's probably not the right idea to have. That's looking at it from the lens of, you know, the adrenal glands being the problem, which is rarely the case with individuals. The command and control center of the metabolism is the hypothalamus, which speaks to the pituitary, which then speaks to the thyroid, the adrenals, and the gonads, the testicles and ovaries. What usually is going on when people start to have issues is this is a hypothalamus issue. Remember, the metabolism is a thermostat. And so what happens is you can kind of think of the thyroid and the adrenals as two big, large engines on a jumbo jet plane. And one of the engines, the command and control center, obviously, is the pilot. How hard is he pushing the plane? How fast is it flying? How is he flying the plane? And then, of course, you know, you can kind of think of the, the uh, testosterone and estrogen and progesterone as sort of being the uh, plane and its anatomical structure or the metal and the wings and all of that stuff that kind of keeps us vital and reproducing, right? What happens when you overly push the command and control center? Well, the engines start to have issues. What would a pilot do if one of the engines blew out? Or, one of the, or he started to see that the airplane was under stress. Well, he would adjust and adapt that airplane, maybe cut back on the power a little bit and divert resources appropriately to those two engines. And so usually what we're really talking about when we're talking about adrenal fatigue is we're talking about the inability of the pilot, the hypothalamus, to hear the signals coming from the thyroid or the adrenals or the gonads, and then adjust appropriately. What we now know is the hypothalamus is sort of like this big TV antenna, basically, that has its, you know, the satellite dish that has its, you know, um, antenna out there listening for signals. And the more sensitive it is to the signals, the more it can adjust and adapt and react. But if there's noise around all the time, constant static, maybe some of the signals can't get through. It, start, it, stops, it starts to lose its ability to respond appropriately to what's going on both in the body and in the outside world. And then that has downstream effects on the thyroid and the adrenals and the gonads. This is almost always what is going on when people are talking about adrenal fatigue. Even the adrenal supplements, like the adaptogens, which would include things like ashwagandha, and rhodiola, and schizandra, and holy basil, and vitex, and all, and, and all the ginsengs, the Korean ginsengs, and, and you know, panax ginseng, eleutherococcus, all of these adaptogens, they are typically always, almost always working at the level of the hypothalamus, not the adrenals. This is why, one of the reasons why you want to use these things while you're training and while you're dieting and while you're putting your metabolism possibly under stress because they can help you adapt and hear the signals. Okay, let me tell you about one of my favorite products for both recovery from exercise to help me gain muscle and stay lean without a lot of extra calories 
and to manage hunger, cravings, and energy levels. This is the product that I use to help me repair, recover from workouts, and manage my diet. It's called Craving Shake. It is a meal replacement shake with 35 grams of protein, enough but not too much carbohydrates. We need those to help us repair and to get our energy levels back. It also has a full spectrum digestive enzyme blend to make sure you are digesting and assimilating these nutrients and it tastes fantastic. If you want to try the product I use every single day, pre and post workout, Craving Shake is the one that you want to check out. You can go to www.drjade.com slash craving dash shake. That's drjade.com slash craving dash shake. Thanks so much, guys. See you on the podcast. So one of the things that we do with adrenal fatigue is first we have to understand what we're really talking about. It is not usually coming from the adrenal glands at all. Very rarely is it coming from the adrenal glands. One of the tests we use to describe this functional state is what's called an adrenal stress index test. And what this does is it measures several different hormones. When it comes to hormones, you don't ever really want to measure them in the urine or the saliva. But in the case of cortisol and DHEA, saliva is actually the best thing to do. And that's great for us because we can do a pretty non-invasive test to look at cortisol, one of the major hormones of the adrenal glands that causes catabolism and breakdown and uh, immune uh, suppression compared to DHEA, which is a major anabolic uh, hormone that sort of offsets some of the negative effects of cortisol. Now, by the way, we have to be careful here of labeling cortisol as negative and DHEA as positive. Really, you want them in good balance. Not enough cortisol causes issues. A lot of people don't know that cortisol is required to sensitize the thyroid receptors and the adrenaline receptors, and so no cortisol is a big issue. Too much cortisol is also an issue. Like Goldilocks, you want it just right. DHEA, the same thing. But we can measure with this adrenal stress index test this ratio of cortisol to DHEA, and we can see some pretty uh, interesting patterns. However, we have to remember and be very careful not to focus just on the adrenal gland and to realize that much of the impetus, the direction for these hormones being released in the first place is coming from where? The hypothalamus. So you'll see very clearly on this adrenal stress index test, this is a test that you can get through Diagnostics Labs. I've run thousands of these in my career. You can see pretty clearly what goes on to stress out the metabolism and to lead to metabolic compensation and resistance and potentially metabolic damage if you're following someone along. What usually happens first is normally in the normal hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, what you will see is under acute stress, you'll see cortisol levels go up and DHEA levels stay low. Then if that stress is eased up, you'll see things go back to normal. And as stress gets a little bit longer, what you'll see is that cortisol levels will stay up and DHEA levels will stay up. Now, if the body begins to repair, DHEA's, DHEA may go a little higher than cortisol. And then in the end stage, you'll see both cortisol and DHEA being suppressed. And if that's coming along with fatigue and some of these other signs or symptoms, we might say this is adrenal fatigue, but we probably should be saying this is hypothalamus fatigue. That's probably a better way to say it, or just metabolic fatigue instead of calling it adrenal fatigue. That is important because if we call it adrenal fatigue, it doesn't really give us many places to go, and much of the things that we're pushing at it end up just being things that work around the adrenal glands. Hey, take some licorice extract. Hey, take some of these you know, adaptogens. At least those adaptogens will help the hypothalamus as well. But what we miss is the point that if it's a brain issue, we need to calm the brain down. And we also sort of miss this idea of that, oh, all I, can, all I need to do is just keep pushing hard, not needing to rest, not needing to pay attention to things, just take some adrenal, quote, adrenal support supplements, and my fatigued adrenals will come back online. And that is just not going to be 
the case. So, yes, we can use some of these tools, but we have to understand how this works. So how do you deal then with a situation where you are feeling fatigued and thinking it's adrenal fatigue? Let's go through this really quickly, and then we'll end this podcast so that we don't spend too much time rambling on. First, you have to realize that adrenal fatigue is not a diagnosis and is definitely not the first thing you need to think of when you're feeling fatigued. The first thing you want to do is rule out anemia. You do this by asking your doctor to get a CBC test. They will measure hemoglobin and hematocrit. You also might want to ask them to do a ferritin test. They can look at iron status in the body. And you want to rule out iron deficiency anemia. That CBC test will also look at MCHC and MCV, two markers of the size of your white blood cells, which indicate the status of folate and B12 to rule out a macrocytic anemia. All of these things are necessary and can lead to fatigue. All of these things are necessary and can lead to fatigue. So you want to rule out anemia. You also want to rule out thyroid issues. And so you'll ask your doctor to do a TSH test as well as a free T3 and a free T4 test to see and to make sure that the thyroid is functioning appropriately. Notice how I haven't said anything yet about the adrenals. This is why it's so important not to get so caught up on I have adrenal fatigue because you need to rule out the most common things first, right? You need to rule out the most common things first. Then you may want to make sure you're not dealing with any bacterial infections or viral infections or things like that. Think back to kind of be like, did I have an infection that's kind of been lingering around? You also want to rule out things like, am I sleep deprived? Am I snoring? Do I have sleep apnea? These are notorious fatigue producers. Then you want to look at blood sugar issues. Are you running, you know, your doctor runs a fasting blood glucose and it's either on the low side, you know, below 70, or on the high side, above 90. Perhaps you're dealing with blood sugar irregularity issues. Are you overweight? Insulin resistant, maybe. This will tell you your body's not getting the blood sugar it needs to feel the brain effects uh, and have a good quality energy levels. Am I deficient? Am I living a westernized lifestyle or exercising like crazy and dieting like crazy for long periods of time? Could it be that I am deficient in some of the vitamins and minerals that help me produce energy, specifically the B vitamins, magnesium, and those kinds of things? I want to make sure I rule those things out as well. And then I can begin to think about maybe my hypothalamus and the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis is leading and causing some issues there. Then maybe I begin to treat that before I go see a doctor maybe and I can treat it on my own. What would I use? Well, if you're just feeling tired in the brain and tired in the head, you may want to consider rhodiola, which is one that we really like. Uh, It has been shown in research, several studies, to help with fatigue especially fatigue of sort of unknown origin. If you're wired but tired, wired in the head but tired in the body, ashwagandha is one that we like just off the shelf. Ashwagandha can also help people who are dealing with thyroid issues. So that's one that we like as well. Typically the dose on those for rhodiol is about 250 milligrams per day up to 500 milligrams per day. Ashwagandha maybe 500 to 1,000. Glutamine is also a wonderful, wonderful Uh, thing for adrenal and hypothalamus issues. One of the things that happens, by the way, as you fatigue your system is the gut begins to become dysfunctional. This can lead to decreased digestion and absorption of food, which could lead to fatigue. Also, the gut is the hub of the immune system. And so what can happen is we can get an overly permeable gut lining due to excess stress This can cause some increased metabolic endotoxemia, a big word you might not understand, but I'll cover it in another episode, uh, a future episode. And this can cause the immune system to be working overtime to try to deal with some of this metabolic inflammation, and that can cause fatigue as well. Well, glutamine does several things. Glutamine can help with stabilizing the lining of the gut. It has been shown to decrease gut permeability. It also can be used to make glucose in low blood sugar states. 
which is really nice. It is one of the things that we need uh, for the immune system to function appropriately. And so glutamine at about 10 grams to 20 grams per day is a really another really nice thing to do. And all of these things can begin to fix so-called adrenal fatigue pretty easily so long as you've ruled out the other things. So hopefully you're seeing the importance of this. Just to review the lessons of this podcast. One, adrenal fatigue is not a diagnostic term, which means that it has some benefits uh, in using the term and some downsides. The benefits are, well, we can't have a diagnostic term, but we can try to describe something that we know functionally occurs that maybe we can do something about. Except when we focus just on the adrenals, we miss the point that this is mostly coming from the brain. And that is very important to understand. It's usually hypothalamic fatigue versus adrenal fatigue that we are dealing with. And that causes us to think about it a little bit differently. It's not just about let me, you know, eat a little bit more, exercise a little bit less, take some supplements. It's like let me recharge, rest, relax, and really work hard to take stress off my body doing a lot of these rest-based activities, these rest and recovery activities, massage, foam rolling, sleep uh, uh, deprivation chambers, Tai Chi, restorative yoga, lots of long walking, hot baths, saunas, all of those, instead of let me just take a bunch of adrenal supplements and licorice and things like that. By the way, licorice, which is a common adrenal supplement that is given, is typically just focused on extending the half-life of cortisol. It doesn't do much in my clinical experience for many people, for some it does, to do much to deal with the actual fatigue because it's not addressing the brain. But ashwagandha, rhodiola, ginseng, some of these things, at least they are working at the level of the hypothalamus and they are working at the level of the adrenals as well. If we're starting to feel this, we want to rule out all the big fatigue causers first, which are many and should come before this mysterious non-diagnostic assumption that we have adrenal fatigue. We want to make sure we rule out these things. Second, we also want to understand, or third rather, we want to understand where we are. We can use the framework that I'm giving you to sort of assess, okay, metabolic compensation, hunger, energy, and cravings, heck and schmeck go out of check, metabolic resistance, I start hitting plateaus, my energy starts getting unpredictable and unstable, metabolic damage, now I may have some serious digestive upsets. The food and protein powder that I was using previously uh, is now causing gas and bloating. I think I may be dealing with thyroid stuff. My mood has changed dramatically. I just got diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. This is when potentially that stress went deeper and deeper and deeper. So yes, these frameworks can help. Yes, a term like adrenal fatigue can be useful so long as you understand the upsides and the downsides. And now I hope that you can look out there and what you're reading in the blogosphere and hearing, you understand like, okay, I've heard this term adrenal fatigue. Jade has, you know, sort of said, and most medicine does not agree that it's even a diagnostic term. Is it useful for me to speak about it that way or not? I need to be smart about this, rule out all other causes of fatigue, and then I can start looking at the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the adrenal axis, and start working with some of the things that we've talked about, including perhaps getting an adrenal stress index test to begin to fix this. So I hope this is helpful for you guys, and maybe I'll tackle metabolic damage in more detail later, but I did want to cover adrenal fatigue because it's such a controversial subject, and I think a lot of people misunderstand it and are using the term too broadly and in a way that may not be helpful. So hopefully this helps you get some extra sort of information into adrenal fatigue and what it might mean or not mean. See you guys at the next podcast. Pop it in real quick just to say thank you so much for your interest and support of the JTTA.com podcast. I am bringing back by popular demand the live Q&A calls I used to do back in the day where you can get on live with me, ask your question directly, and have me answer it in full. Questions about thyroid and adrenal health, autoimmune disease, any health condition, belly fat, muscle building, performance enhancement, 
you name it, we are going to cover it on the Q&A podcast. If you'd like to be on these live Q&A calls with me and speak to me directly, all you need to do is become a patron of the podcast. You can go to www.patreon.com backslash jtita. That's www.patreon.com slash Jade Tita, become a patron of the podcast. I would greatly appreciate your support, and you'll be able to access me live to answer all your questions in depth. Thanks again for your support. See you on the podcast. <laughs>